Hi, welcome back to educator.com. This is the lesson on metabolism and nutrition. So with the basics of metabolism, uh, the word metabolism is often misused by people I've talked to. Um, usually people just talk about metabolism in terms of, oh, she's so lucky. She gets to eat whatever she wants. Her metabolism must be really high. There is truth to that statement, but uh, people only think of metabolism as uh, keeping weight off or metabolism the other way, uh, gaining weight. But metabolism, the actual definition of it is that it is the sum of all chemical reactions within an organism. So it includes all the breakdown of nutrients that, that you need to do through digestion and all of the building of molecules that you need to do to maintain your body and stay healthy. So metabolism involves a basic formula that would be catabolism plus anabolism. So the catabolism part is the breakdown of organic molecules. So every time you break down a sugar that you've eaten, uh, a lipid that you've eaten, which is a fat, uh, a protein that you've eaten, that's a catabolic kind of reaction and it would involve uh, the release of energy. Anabolism is the opposite. It's the synthesis of new organic molecules, which typically requires energy and energy input to get those things linked together. So when you build muscle proteins, um, when you make glycogen, which is a, uh, a sugar storage molecule that's uh, mostly found in the liver, those are anabolic reactions. Um, so the ana anabolism part, what are you doing it for? Well, it's for structural maintenance and repairs, um, for support of growth. So as you grow, of course, you need to build uh, more molecules. Uh, for secretions, um, you need to build hormones, you need to build secretory products uh, that you're going to be letting go uh, through glands. And then for nutrient reserves, like I just mentioned earlier, glycogen. Um, if it's been hours since you've eaten, you can release sugars from that giant storage molecule that we call glycogen, uh, and that gets you through until the next meal. The way that I remember the difference between catabolism and anabolism is I remember the term anabolic steroids. So if you follow sports especially, you hear about anabolic steroids uh, that athletes will use to um, bulk up their mus musculature a lot more than they could uh, naturally without it. And the reason why it's an anabolic steroid is uh, it is a molecule that um, mimics testosterone and it allows them to have a lot more anabolic development of their muscle tissue. They are, they are building a lot more muscle proteins than is natural. So anabolism, anabolic steroids, uh, the building up of organic molecules. So we look at nutrients that we take in, in our diet. Um, there are four major uh, organic compounds uh, in terms of looking at them and, and, and their structural differences and what they're for. Carbohydrates is one of them. They're also called sugars. Lipids, also known as fats. Proteins, uh, one of the more important ones. Uh, and they're all important, but uh, proteins make up the majority of your um, solid matter. If you took all the water out of an organism, the next most abundant substance is going to be protein. Uh, extremely important for cellular uh, structure and functionality. And the nucleic acids. You can't deny the importance of nucleic acids. That's DNA and RNA. Um, and it's interesting to you know have that under nutrients, um, but anytime you eat um, animal tissue, uh, plant tissue, even if it's dead, you're going to have these molecules in there that you are also uh, going to consume. And you can break down those nucleic acids to make uh, your own uh, nucleic acids in terms of stringing together new DNA, new RNA. Uh, vitamins and minerals. Vitamins, definitely also a, an organic compound. Uh, the reason why these are separate is vitamins are those, um, those molecules that you don't have the ability to make enough of them on your own. Uh, you do have to take them into your diet. Um, for instance, if you stop taking in um, vitamin A uh, early on in your life, that could cause your eyesight to suffer. Um, but people who have enough vitamin A in their diet, they may gradually uh, need glasses, but in terms of their eye health, it's going to be uh, maximized by having enough vitamin A. So you do have reserves of vitamins typically in your body, but if you don't take them in, in your diet, you're going to run out. And then minerals. Uh, we'll cover these towards the end. Minerals uh, you get from electrolytes, stuff like sodium, potassium, etc. Oh, and before we move on, uh, this picture right here, if you're wondering what that is, these are a kind of packing peanut. Like if you got a, a big box with something shipped to you, instead of using styrofoam peanuts, these are actually made of starch. So this is entirely natural. Um, you could eat them if you wanted to. 
it's kind of like uh, um, those puffy cheese snacks without any flavoring. Um, but yeah, completely natural, um, uh, a biodegradable uh, replacement for styrofoam packing peanuts. Carbohydrate structure. So we just talked about packing peanuts made of carbohydrates on the previous slide. Carbohydrates, these are sugars. And the interesting thing about the name carbohydrate is that when you look at the carbon atoms in one of these molecules, it's surrounded by water, H2O, H, and OH. So together, this is water. Together, this is water. Carbo, like carbon, hydrate, like water. So it's an easy way to remember the structure of a carbohydrate. And this is the typical basic sugar structure uh, in, in terms of a little ratio. Um, N is some variable, so we could put six in there. Okay, so for every six carbon atoms, you're going to have twice as many hydrogens and the same amount of oxygens as carbons. Uh, we could put an eight in here. We could put a hundred in here. Um, any integer uh, will work. So um, you can have slight variation of this. Uh, depending on the precise sugar you're talking about, but typically, more often than not, you're going to see this ratio. So if you counted these up, you would see that. If there were six carbons, it could be glucose. Um, if there are um, twice as many, you're going to get something like a disaccharide, uh, which is like two little glucoses or monosaccharides put together. You're going to see the ring or linear form. Um, this is the ring form down here, of course. It, it looks like a little ring. Uh, this would be known as a hexose sugar because it has six sides. Glucose is a hexose sugar. This is the linear form. You tend to see the ring form more often in the human body. Uh, it's more stable molecularly than the linear form, but you, you can occasionally see this. And the way you go from linear to ring or vice versa is carbon number one would connect to carbon number six, and the, uh, the, the double bond here would actually go away when you make uh, that connection. Um, carbon makes uh, four bonds. If, if you took chemistry, you know that carbon likes to make four bonds. That's why uh, with every carbon here, you're gonna see four little lines around it, whether it's a double bond or single bond. Over here, another way of writing this is the H could be sticking out here, a little hydrogen, hydrogen sticking out here, and then the OH or hydroxide here. But this is a shorthand version. Speaking of shorthand, when you look at this ring form, uh, this is classic organic chemistry. Every corner here that's not labeled as O is carbon. So there's a carbon here, carbon, 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 carbon. And what they're leaving out is the H. It's just implied that on the other side of this OH is going to be an H. On the other side of this OH is going to be an H. Uh, same with over here. So if you're wondering why is there uh, stuff missing, that's why. So monosaccharides are single sugars. Glucose is the classic one. Uh, disaccharides is a, is a double sugar. So we could connect these two glucoses to make something called maltose. Maltose is a disaccharide. That's where you get malt sugar from. And the way it happens is uh, you make a glycosidic linkage which is just a fancy term for saying a bond between uh, two monosaccharides. And the way you do that is through a dehydration synthesis or dehydration reaction. And the way that I remember that term is all you need to do is take water out. That's why it's dehydration. So here's an H, here's an OH on the next sugar. When these two leave together, H2O is gone. So that's why it's dehydration. And what you're left with is this oxygen. So if I then erase what has, has left effectively, the water is gone. The way that you get this glycosidic linkage is through that, that oxygen connection. So you're going to have carbon connected to oxygen and then connected over there. Now the angle because of this drawing is not precise, but um, that's what you're going to see as a glycosidic linkage is you're going to have this oxygen atom linking up the two neighboring uh, sugars. And so a disaccharide um, includes maltose. Fructose is another one, um, which you're going to find in, in fruits. Uh, there's a lot of other disaccharide names, but those are a couple. Polysaccharides is when you have bigger sugars. You keep putting little sugars strung together and you're going to eventually get things like starch. So, so examples of polysaccharides, starch, which is the way that plants uh, store sugars. You also have glycogen. Glycogen is how we store sugars uh, in our liver and, and muscles. Uh, starch and glycogen, both made of lots and lots and lots of glucoses. It's just the way that the glucoses are bonded together is slightly different in terms of um, the way the, uh, the, the glycosidic linkage looks. And then 
Another good example of a polysaccharide is chitin. I know it looks like chitin, but... Chitin, uh, you find that in the exoskeletons of arthropods and also in the cell walls of fungi. Um, you also can use chitin to make uh, surgical threads that you can um, you know, sew up something sur surgically and they actually will dissolve. Um, those, those chitin threads will decompose eventually, uh, which is kind of cool. So dehydration synthesis is how you get two sugars together. The opposite, like if I wanted to break these two sugars apart, is called a hydrolysis. And that's made of hydro and lysis. Hydro means water. Lysis means a breaking apart or splitting apart. So water splitting them apart. And it's the opposite of that dehydration reaction we just went over, that if water left to connect these two, water going in can also uh, do the opposite. It can separate them. Uh, sugars are water soluble. That's obvious if you, um, you know, put pieces of bread in water, you see them dissolve pretty easily. Uh, pasta, you know, when we boil pasta or some other noodle, um, it's very obvious that sugars, which make up uh, the majority of pasta, it's, it's water soluble. It, it, it is a uh, polar kind of thing rather than non-polar, which is the lipid side. And hey, the, the purpose of carbohydrates in general is they are a really quick efficient energy source. Um, that's how we get the most of um, our, our energy molecules in our cells. ATP is, is kind of like an energy currency that fuels our cells and keeps us alive. And the easiest way to get that is breaking down carbohydrates or sugars. So we need to talk about aerobic respiration. Uh, this is how you actually get energy out of the breakdown of organic molecules and keeping your cells going. So it's the process of breaking down carbohydrates or other organic compounds that you can um, sort of turn into a carbohydrate-like molecule with the help of oxygen. That's what's aerobic about it, uh, that you need to breathe in oxygen to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which you're gonna hear more about on the next slide. And that is the energy molecule. There are other molecules that are similar, but ATP, very common. Most of the process occurs in mitochondria. So if you uh, took biology, you learned that mitochondria are kind of the powerhouses of the cell. That's where you get uh, ATP from typically if, if you're eukaryotic like we are. So here's a, a mitochondrion. Mitochondrion, this is an actual um, uh, electron microscope taking a picture of mitochondria in uh, human cells. This is sort of your classic um, computer generated model of, of what a mitochondrion looks like. And if you were to look clo uh, carefully or closely at this particular diagram, you can see that the, uh, the outside is a double membrane, inner and outer membrane. The inside, you have these uh, membranous folds, and it's called cristae. Uh, and then on the inside, you have the matrix. So you do have this, like, uh, two sets of membranes here. Uh, that's why the space in between the cristae and the inner part of the double membrane on the outside is called the intermembrane space. Uh, but we're going to cover these parts because aerobic respiration, it starts out outside of the mitochondrion, but then it ends up going in. Speaking of the term mitochondria, that is plural. Mitochondrion, with an O-N at the end, is, uh, is singular. So the three main parts of aerobic respiration, using oxygen to break down sugar to make ATP, is glycolysis, which is the initial breakdown of the sugar molecule. The Krebs cycle, which takes the products of glycolysis and goes through a cycle to to help make other molecules that are gonna transfer energy to the end of the process. And the end of the process is oxidative phosphorylation where we're making a lot of ATP, the energy molecule. And by the end, you're producing approximately 36 ATP. Uh, the reason why it's approximate is depending on the conditions inside the cell uh, at that moment. Uh, sometimes it could be 34, sometimes it could be 38, uh, but generally we get 36 ATP from one glucose molecule being broken down with oxygen. So what is this ATP molecule? So ATP is adenosine triphosphate, A-T-P. Uh, and here's a, a model of it. So where does the name come from? Well, this part here, you got these uh, two rings of, of carbon with nitrogen and some hydrogen thrown in there. Uh, you have adenine. And adenine is a nitrogenous base that you would find in DNA and RNA, but here it has nothing to do with genetics. Uh, you're using adenine as, as kind of like a placeholder for what's going on here. And then what is this? Well, this is ribose, a kind of 
monosaccharide, uh, simple sugar. Uh, it is a uh, pentose sugar because it's five-sided. Uh, but adenine, ribose, and then three oops, phosphates. So here's where the name comes from, adenosine. So the combination of these two, adenosine, instead of saying adenine ribose, three phosphates, adenosine triphosphate, three phosphates. Uh, so that's where the name comes from. And you're gonna see the word or, or abbreviation ADP also on this slide. That's when one of these phosphates is gone and then it's diphosphate. So adenosine triphosphate is kind of like a charged battery that you can use to power something in a cell. When you go back to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, the battery has no more juice in a sense. Uh, the other analogy I, I've heard is um, like a rubber band. Uh, if I stretch the rubber band, that's ATP. If I let it go, it goes back to ADP. And, and to stretch it back again, you gotta add that third phosphate. You do see AMP in cells as well, adenosine monophosphate, but uh, we're gonna talk a lot about how you get ATP from ADP in the next few slides. So like I said, it's the energy currency of a cell. You can spend it in terms of uh, powering uh, anything that needs to happen in a cell that requires energy. So ATP is broken down into that adenosine diphosphate plus the other phosphate. So when ATP breaks apart, you get these two, uh, and that's a release of energy. That's how you spend uh, the currency. To get it back, you got to put these back together, and that requires energy to, to attach them back together. And that's how you get ATP. So up here, when you break it down, that is an exergonic reaction. Here, it would be endergonic, the uh, input of energy. And amazingly, the average muscle cell, which is doing a lot of work in, in a typical day, uh, doing a lot of movement, of course, the average muscle cell produces 10 million ATP molecules per second if it's working. That's amazing to think about. Um, that's mind boggling uh, that a microscopic cell is producing um, millions and millions of these molecules every second just to keep it going. All right, so to start aerobic respiration is glycolysis. And the word glycolysis, glyco, lysis, glyco meaning sugar, lysis meaning breakdown. Uh, like the word lysosome, it's, it's one of those uh, organelles in a cell that breaks stuff down, like, like foreign, pro, foreign bodies, uh, uh, pathogens, waste. In this case, we're breaking apart a sugar. Glucose is usually the one. And pyruvate is what you get at the end here. Uh, that is a three carbon um, half of glucose in a sense. And it occurs in the cytoplasm. Uh, I've read that the uh, average glucose molecule doesn't easily fit into uh, mitochondrion. It's broken down into these two, which then enter the mitochondrion to finish the aerobic respiration process. So let me take you through this step by step uh, and, and do my best to simplify it. So phase one, the way you're looking at here is these lavender, magenta, whatever, purple dots, whatever you want to call them, these represent the carbons. So we're focusing on the carbons of glucose. Glucose contains six carbons. What you're not seeing here is the H's and O's, and, and that's fine uh, because we're ca concentrating on the carbon count here. So to initially get it started, they call it the energy investment phase, and you have to invest two ATPs. Now remember, ATP, that's usable energy. The phosphates come off of it, to give you two ADP. And then you can see in the next shot, these little yellow dots, they're inorganic phosphates. That's why it's PI, not, not pi like 3.14. Um, this is an inorganic phosphate, inorganic phosphate, and they came from these two ATP molecules. Then you get a splitting of this glucose in half. So now G3P, uh, I believe stands for glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. You don't need to know that, but um, so you now have kind of like a half a sugar with a phosphate attached to it, half a sugar with a phosphate attached to it. And the next thing that happens is some of the hydrogens are stripped off of this and you end up getting what's called NADH. So initially you have something called NAD plus, I'll explain this. NAD plus is, is like an electron carrier. Think of it as a boat or shuttle for electrons. And when it takes them somewhere and the electrons go into a, a, a reaction, the flow of the electrons can power 
the making of ATP eventually at the end. So this is uh, kind of investing uh, to get way more ATP way at the end. Uh, so NAD+, plus, when electrons or hydrogen, which contains electrons, comes onto it, you get NADH. So this is, this is like the powered NAD+, plus that's going to dump its electrons uh, later on. And so you make this in the next uh, few parts of rogue respiration for the payoff at the end. You're going to see at the end, the NADH will give up the H, protons and electrons, uh, to help make a lot of ATP at the end. The next thing that happens is you now have a vacancy here. Uh, remember, carbon always likes to have four bonds. And something is left. Uh, the, the bond is gone. And free, there's free ph phosphates around. They're put into place here. So now you have these little halves of glucose, each with two phosphates. And the great thing is, uh, in the next step, is where you get some payoff. Remember, this was an energy investment. You had to invest two, but you know, at the end, you get four ATP, and it comes from attaching these four phosphates onto four ADPs. And then you get four ATP. And the great thing is, four ATP, more than the, what we invested initially, four ATP minus the two, still a net gain, total gain of two ATP. So just breaking down sugar gives you a little energy in itself, uh, but we're going to get a lot more later on. Um, in addition to the making of a net gain of two ATP, the two NADHs, you also have two pyruvates, also called pyruvic acid. So these two pyruvates each undergo a slight modification and enter what's called the Krebs cycle. So two Krebs cycles happen, uh, one cycle for each of these, to continue the process of aerobic respiration. And these pyruvates, they're going to be going in the mitochondria. So the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle because uh, the first part of the cycle involves the making of citric acid, but a scientist named Krebs this is the one who, who named it, named it after himself, and uh, you know it's in honor of him. And the Krebs cycle, you can sometimes see it uh, labeled as um, uh, TCA cycle, the citric acid cycle, but uh, usually these are interchangeable. So pyruvate gets modified into what's called acetyl-CoA, and CoA stands for coenzyme A. It's uh, shuttling this acetyl to the Krebs cycle, which is in the mitochondrial matrix. If you remember from the previous image, here's a mitochondrion, if we looked at a cross-section of it. Uh, the Krebs cycles, they are happening in here. The mitochondrial matrix, which is within that criste. Uh, the uh, glycolysis stuff happened outside here, happened in the cytoplasm. And those pyruvates come in, and there's a lot of action going on here. Krebs cycles galore. So it takes two pyruvates, attaches them to a four carbon molecule called oxaloacetic acid or oxaloacetate, and then eventually breaks that down, uh, the citric acid down, uh, to make more electron carriers. And you actually do get a little ATP out of it. So what initially happens, let's use, um, let's use red for um, the carbons. So here's pyruvate. And eventually, you're going to get this out of it. So what happens is pyruvate uh, is modified um, to make this little acetyl. And what happens is you get Let's use a blue box. This is coenzyme A. This helps modify and take pyruvate into the Krebs cycle. Uh, once it's here, by the way, the little blue box leaves and goes and picks up another pyruvate. The other little pieces that happen here is you do make some NADH. So in addition to a CO2 leaving, that's how you get from uh, pyruvate with three carbons to this little acetyl, which was attached to here, to acetyl-CoA. Um, that's how you get the one less carbon is CO2 leaves. And guess what happens to that CO2? <sighs> we exhale it. 
you're going to see a couple CO2s leave uh, in the Krebs cycle as well. And, and that's waste that you're going to inevitably breathe out. That's waste from the process of breaking down sugar. Um, so here's basically what happens. This is how it gets modified to give you the acetyl, which is uh, helped to get modified from the CoA. And this joins in with a four carbon molecule to give you. Remember, that's called oxaloacetate or oxaloacetic acid. This is citrate or citric acid. Yeah, the same citric acid you'd find in citrus fruits, but uh, we are producing this constantly, every second of every day of our, of our life uh, in Krebs cycles. Um, the, the cool thing about remembering the sequence here is that the first two steps are identical in terms of uh, what ends up happening. The first step is that, and by the way, these are all catalyzed or ca um, help, they, they are helped to occur uh, from enzymes. So these are enzyme catalyzed reactions. Um, they don't all just happen naturally. This breakdown doesn't just happen unassisted. Uh, there's enzymes, um, proteins that help all of these things happen uh, in sequence. So the first step is that CO2 leaves. And guess what? That happens again in the second step. CO2 leaves and we'll eventually get down to the four carbon molecule again. It's not quite the same as this because some other things will be stripped off of this molecule, but you can see that once we get to this point, no more CO2 is leaving because at the end here, we have to come back, regenerate this uh, four carbon molecule. In the first two steps, also you make some NADH, yay. The more NADH you make, the more ATP you inevitably, inevitably will produce at the end. Uh, so see those two uh, steps in the beginning, basically the same. Next thing that happens, you make an ATP. I'm simplifying this a bit. Um, so ADP comes over and gains a phosphate to become ATP. Yay! Where does the phosphate come from? Well, um, there's a molecule, um, GTP, that helps uh, get the phosphate into place. So there are actually a few little mini steps here that I'm, that I'm glossing over. But uh, the end result from, from this part of the Krebs cycle is you get the production of one ATP. So each Krebs cycle does give you another ATP. That's great. Next step, we make something called FADH2. FADH2 is very similar to NADH. The hydrogens that FAD, FAD, gains, it's gonna dump off in the last part of aerobic respiration to get a lot of ATP. Um, by the way, FAD, NAD plus, what do those stand for? Uh, I don't remember. They are long names and that's why we have abbreviations for them. So FAD, also a uh, electron proton carrier or raft, if you want to think of it that way. And now it's carrying that stuff. It's stripped them off of this molecule. One more step and then we are home free. Next thing that happens is you get one more NADH and we're going to add up the products, the stuff that we take away from this in a moment. We wouldn't count this as a product, even though we're left over with this four carbon molecule oxaloacetate, because it needs to go back into this Krebs cycle. It's not something we are taking away from the cycle. What we are taking away is how many NADHs? One, two, three. Um, you could count this one as well. Uh, a lot of people refer to this as the intermediate step between uh, glycolysis and Krebs cycle, but you do get a few NADHs. You get one ATP, one FADH2, two CO2s. Um, this is a waste product, but it is a product nonetheless. Uh, nonetheless. So the uh, Krebs cycle, um, important step in, in the process of um, aerobic respiration. And next, we're going to the cristae of the mitochondria to actually uh, make a load of ATP.
Oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative, um, you may think, oh, because of oxygen. Um, that's fine if you want to remember that, uh, but the oxidative part, um, when you oxidize something, you're breaking it apart. Electrons are coming off of it. Uh, when you reduce something, electrons are gained. So oxidation reduction or, or you know, redox reactions is another way to put it. Uh, you learn about those in chemistry. If you get those mixed up, I remember that since electrons are negatively charged, uh, when you say that something is reduced, you're adding electrons. So more negatives like reduces it um, in terms of like if you think of a number line. Oxidative or oxidation, um, that has to do with uh, the opposite. Um, you actually are, are breaking something apart. So NADH and FADH2, they're oxidized in this process. They lose what they gained when they were reduced um, and they end up helping to make a lot of ATP. And that's phosphorylation. When you are adding uh, phosphates to something, you are phosphorylating it. And you're uh, phosphorylating ADP to make a lot of ATP. So now all these NADHs and FADH2s that were made uh, in glycolysis in the Krebs cycle, you actually use them here. So you can see that here's our NADH that was made in the mitochondrial matrix. This is a simplified version of the Criste membrane. It's, it's just a rectangle here, but uh, typically you'd see it kind of, uh, you know, uh, weavy. But anyways, uh, all along the Criste, that inner membrane of the mitochondria, you're going to have... Uh, these these proteins embedded in the criste in that inner membrane and they're going to be shuttling along electrons and what happens to the protons is all these h pluses that's that's a proton h plus is, is just a proton so nadh gave up protons so does fadh2 and they go across the membrane into the intermembrane space so you get a buildup of all kinds of protons here It's like, um, what's going to end up happening is it, it's basically um, kind of like diffusion of protons in a sense that's going to be happening. And they actually nickname it uh, chemiosmosis. Chemiosmosis is a fancy term for uh, the flow of protons that's going to end up going through this ATP synthase to make a lot of ATP. And the electron transport chain is the other uh, part that happens here. And I'm going to use blue to highlight that. Um, so all along here, you get electrons and electrons, their final destination is actually going to be oxygen. Uh, they call oxygen gas here. And then finally, we're hearing about oxygen and aerobic respiration. They call oxygen gas here the final electron acceptor. It also technically is accepting protons, too, because you end up making water. Um, it's like the opposite of photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, water is broken down and give you electrons, protons, and oxygen gas. Here, it's the opposite. Oxygen gas is accepting these electrons moving through, and then you get water. Um, the water that's produced here in aerobic respiration is not enough to uh, hydrate a human being. I've heard that some animals in extremely arid, dry conditions uh, can go for days and days and days without drinking water. And for them... The amount of water that they're producing in aerobic respiration is enough to keep them hydrated. That's not true for us, uh, but water is a product of aerobic respiration. So what happens to the protons? The protons build up in here, and they are going to be fueling directly the making of ATP. It's like water flowing through a water wheel. Uh, the water turns the wheel, and then you end up getting something being powered the flow of electrons through ATP synthase, it's kind of like a turbine that spins. And, and as it spins, it helps attach phosphates to ADP, and you get a load of ATP, um, uh, close to 30 ATP from, from, from doing this. And that's amazing uh, to consider because we got a net gain of two from glycolysis. Uh, we got a total of two uh, from the two Krebs cycles. So the vast majority of ATP you're making during oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, and then, yeah, once you have NAD plus left over, an FAD, that's going to go back and into the citric acid cycle. It, some of it will exit um, mitochondria. Uh, um, there's probably actually already enough NAD plus outside the mitochondria for glycolysis. But nonetheless, the point is that the cycles keep going. As long as you're uh, supplying glucose, sugar, and oxygen, you're going to keep having uh, aerobic respiration occurring. So what happens when there's not enough oxygen 
It's called anaerobic respiration. So after glycolysis, glycolysis, keep in mind, does not require oxygen. There was no oxygen involved there. After glycolysis, the initial breakdown of sugar, if enough O2 is not available, pyruvates, the product of glycolysis, undergo fermentation. And what we do as animals or human, human beings specifically is lactic acid fermentation. There's also alcohol fermentation, which we take advantage of uh, when we make alcoholic beverages or even when we bake bread, um, yeast uh, do alcohol uh, or alcoholic fermentation. Uh, but we do lactic acid fermentation. So lactic acid uh, is formed after glycolysis if there's no O2. And that's what causes a burning sensation in our muscles. If we go for a long run or do a lot of uh, intense activity in a short amount of time and you end up being out of breath and you get that burning sensation in your muscles, it's lactic acid. Um, the more active you are, like if you're an Olympic athlete, uh, you're probably not feeling that lactic acid burn uh, because the efficiency of your body has been improved over years. Uh, but lactic acid, uh, research has shown that um, you know, I, it, it makes sense that it would kind of slow you down. It's like, ah, oh, my muscles hurt. But what lactic acid also does in your bloodstream is it actually stimulates you to uh, breathe more, to take more breaths, which is going to get more O2 in so that inevitably uh, you'll be able to stop doing that anaerobic respiration and go back to aerobic once you've gotten a little rest. So fermentation, the uh, specifically the lactic acid variety, produces only the ATP from glycolysis, no additional ATP happened from fermentation. Um, that means that anaerobic respiration as a whole, the total amount of ATP is just a net gain of two. There's no Krebs cycle. There's no oxidative phosphorylation uh, because, the, hey, there's no making of ATP during this fermentation process. So here's lactic acid fermentation, glucose initially. Glycolysis happens. You get the two pyruvates or pyruvic acids. And here's the real fermentation part. Um, NAD is regenerated. It's the opposite of what happened in um, a glycolysis. We made NADH. So you can see that the NADH formed from glycolysis gives back the H's it gained uh, to make NAD plus again. And then once you add that stuff from, from NADH, back, NADH uh, back to pyruvate, you end up getting two lactic acids, or here they call it lactate. Uh, and that's what causes that burning sensation in your muscles. Um, you can do anaerobic respiration uh, for a period of time in your muscles, no problem. Anaerobic respiration in your brain, that's, that's a problem. Um, your brain, without enough oxygen gas for several minutes, uh, can result in brain death. So something like your muscles can deal with anaerobic respiration. Um, other tissues, their demand for oxygen and need for oxygen uh, is, is even more. All right, so I mentioned earlier that um, you could have other organic molecules be uh, broken apart for energy besides sugar. Now, sugar is the classic one that is broken down, but you can end up making um, glucose through gluconeogenesis uh, from other organic precursors. Like, you could take lactic acid and make glucose out of it. Um, you're probably going to need uh, two lactic acids because uh, lactic acid has uh, three carbons. Uh, glycerol, uh, which is a part of lipids, uh, it actually has a similar um, um, beginning to the name, uh, you know, glycolysis, glucose, glycerol. Glycerol is also three carbons. And you can take amino acids. The way that you take amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, and make glucose out of it is deamination. You're taking off what's called an amino group, which makes it an amino acid. So deamination is one example of how uh, gluconeogenesis can happen. So you're taking uh, an amino acid here um, and through the help of an enzyme uh, and, and adding water, you end up getting NH3. Uh, this right here uh, is an amino group on an amino acid taken off. And then this uh, resembles uh, a sugar much more and it can easily enter somewhere in that aerobic respiration process. Sometimes um, you're modifying it to make glucose um, you can also sometimes modify a molecule so it can become an acetyl and it goes straight into the Krebs cycle. But either way, um, gluconeogenesis is a way that you can end up getting energy um, through aerobic respiration from other organic molecules. Glycogenesis would be making glycogen, a huge polysaccharide, a storage kind of sugar, from itty-bitty glucoses, the monosaccharides. Uh, and then the opposite, glycogenolysis, uh, it, remember, lysis is the breakdown. This is the breakdown of glycogen uh, to make glucose. 
So here we're making the storage molecule, here we're breaking apart the storage molecule. Um, insulin is a hormone that gets sugars out of your bloodstream and package it away as glycogen. So glycogenesis would happen thanks to insulin. Glycogenolysis would happen thanks to something called glucagon, which you can hear more about in the endocrine system lessons. So now moving on to lipids, lipid structure and function. They're called fats, and a classic example is triglycerides. So um, you can have a fat that's not a triglyceride, um, like cholesterol. Okay, that's that's also a lipid, that's also a, a fatty substance. Uh, but triglycerides are the classic one that you, you hear a lot about in textbooks. So what is a triglyceride made of? It's made of a glycerol attached to three fatty acids. That's where the name triglyceride comes from. So glycer from that word glycerol, tri, three fatty acid chains attached to it. So the glycerol, similar to a sugar, um, here is the glycerol portion right here. You see the three carbons, uh, hydrogens attached to it. And initially they have little OHs here. That's what is, is the, the term uh, all like alcohol, um, they have OHs, hydroxides attached to them. But what happens to the H? Well, when you attach the uh, three fatty acids on here, uh, that reaction makes it so that actually it's just oxygen attached to a carbon, oxygen attached to a carbon. Remember from before with uh, those ring structures, the, the ring shape of the glucose, at the corners here, the shorthand version is, hey, these are carbons. What's attached to the carbons? Hydrogens. So the other name for these fatty acid chains, which I'm going to use red for, is hydrocarbon chains. So here's a fatty acid chain. Here's a fatty acid chain. They can vary in length. Depending on the precise fatty acid chain that's attached to it, because they all have different names, you get different triglycerides. There's a lot of different triglycerides. Uh, lipids are nonpolar, opposite of water. They are not soluble in water. Um, you know, just drizzling oil, like vegetable oil, in a, uh, a pan of water, it's easy to see that. They, they don't like mixing together. Uh, so this is the only organic compound as, as a whole that's always nonpolar. And what are these for? Energy source, insulation, and hormone synthesis. You actually can get a heck of a lot of energy uh, out of a lipid molecule. Um, per gram, you can get more ATP out of it than sugars, actually. Insulation. Um, think about all the lipids under your skin at the lowest parts or deepest parts of your um, integumentary system. Um, it's a cushioning. It's also insulatory in terms of helping to keep you warm. And then hormone synthesis. There are some hormones without fat in your body you would not be able to make. Uh, estrogen is an example. Um, that's why women who end up having a very, very low, like dangerously low body fat percentage, sometimes will, um, their, their, their menstrual cycle will stop completely uh, because they've stopped making enough estrogen to keep it going. And over time, that's, that's not very healthy. Oh, and one more thing before I move on. Um, right here, you see an additional line. This is a double bond. Uh, the double bonds here make little kinks in the fatty acid chains. And that's going to come up in a little bit with uh, the difference between uh, saturated fats versus unsaturated fats. Here we go, saturated versus unsaturated fats. So saturated fats have no double bonds in the hydrocarbon chains. So when you don't have um, the double bonds in that chain of hydrocarbons, so just carbon, 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 with H's attached all over it. If you have no double bonds, you don't get little kinks. The, the double bond can make it kind of bend. So they're all flat. When they're flat, I like to think of it as like this, okay? This textbook, um, all of these pages, these hundreds of pages are all very flat with respect to each other. They're not bent, uh, they're not folded. And so it's easy to close the book and make it very dense. Think of a lot of um, saturated fats as being that way. So saturated fats are typically solid at room temperature, like butter. So why is butter solid? It's because of the saturated fat that you end up getting from, from typically animal uh, tissue. And if you have a lot of those saturated fats stacked closely together, they will be denser, they will be more solid. Unlike unsaturated fats, which have at least one double bond in the hydrocarbon chains, and the double bonds make it kink. 
And here's the example I'd like to use for that. Um, the, here's a flat piece of paper, which, you know, like I said earlier, if it was saturated fats, they could be stacked really close together. But imagine I make it bendy like this. Okay, now these are representing those double bonds causing kinks in the chains. If I lay a bunch of these on top of each other, it's hard to make them densely compacted. And that's why unsaturated fats tend to be um, liquid at room temperature, like this olive oil. Um, don't get me wrong, olive oil, vegetable oils can have a little bit of uh, saturated fat in them, but nowhere near as much as uh, butter. Um, so you're going to see more unsaturated fats in oils from plants. So yeah, typically liquid at room temperature, uh, like vegetable oils. So what does this have to do with your health? Well, the higher uh, uns unsaturated fat you have in your diet, uh, the less likely it is you're going to get plaques developing um, in, in your uh, arteries, specifically coronary arteries. Uh, that's where you end up getting a heart attack. So if you have a diet high in saturated fat, uh, the amount of saturated fat flowing through your bloodstream, in addition to stuff like cholesterol, you're more likely to get um, fatty streaks, little streaks of fats on, on the inside of those blood vessels. And over time, uh, plaques can develop uh, that cause um, the width of that artery to get more and more narrow. And the more narrow, the less blood flow, and inevitably that affects your heart in a negative way. So keeping the amount of saturated fats down in your diet, important. Um, unsaturated fats, uh, they're a good thing. Lipid catabolism. So catabolism, remember, is a breakdown. Uh, so lipolysis or lipolysis is the breakdown of lipids for energy use. Um, so when we t take, let's say, a triglyceride and break it apart, what happens to the glycerol? Well, the glycerol is converted to pyruvate, which, remember, also has uh, three carbons, like glycerol, and it enters the Krebs cycle. Remember, uh, modified pyruvate uh, becomes acetyl-CoA and enters the Krebs cycle. Fatty acids are processed by enzymes to make acetyl-CoA. Uh, so you can actually chop up a fatty acid into lots of different acetyl-CoAs because fatty acids can be like, you know, let's say uh, 40 carbons long sometimes um, or, or less. Beta oxidation, so related to those fatty acids. When you take fatty acids and you break them down into two carbon fragments to make this, um, something amazing happens in terms of the amount of ATP you get out of that. From one 18 carbon fatty acid chain, you can actually get 144 ATP from just that one chain. That's more than from um, glucose. So you might wonder, well then why doesn't our body uh, just use fats uh, way more than, than sugars if it's more efficient? Well, um, the speed at which breakdown of a sugar happens way, way faster. Um, yes, if, if you're taking in sugars and lipids, your body will use some of those lipids uh, to break down um, uh, them into make a making ATP. But the ease at which sugar is broken down to make ATP is, is the reason why our body tends to rely on that more. Um, a common misconception about diets is people will uh, just have like hardly any fat intake, but their intake of sugar may be too high. Well, your body will actually sometimes take that excess sugar and it can store it as fat. Um, so you gotta, you know, watch your diet, not just looking at no fat, um, where are your calories, calories coming from uh, as a whole. All right, so in terms of making lipids, um, lipogenesis, um, the origin of lipids, that's the building of lipid molecules. Um, some fatty acids, though, can't be built um, in terms of, um, you know, stringing together that chain and, and then attaching it to a glycerol. And they're called essential fatty acids, like linoleic acid or linolenic acid. Those you have to get in your diet. Um, you're not making them on your own. Uh, the others, yeah. Lipoproteins, it, the name says it all. It's a lipid protein complex. Uh, so when we look at um, lipoproteins, the first one uh, is actually made in your intestinal epithelium. Uh, so as you eat fats in the lining of your intestine, you're gonna make these uh, chylomicrons. And um, you know, too much of these, yes, your, your amount of um, lipid molecules in your bloodstream may be too high. Um, and then inevitably you end up storing uh, too many fats in your adipose tissue, which is at the deepest part of your um, integumentary system. Uh, next up we have these four. 
Okay, these four all are made in the liver, unlike the chylomicrons. So very low density lipoproteins. Um, if you look at the, the sequence of these down to LDLs, um, LDLs and then finally HDLs are going to have slightly more percentage of protein involved. Um, so very low density lipoproteins, intermediate density lipoproteins, um, I mean, they're important in terms of um, um, producing molecules, um, shuttling molecules. But when we look at LDLs and HDLs, you may have heard about these in terms of um, good and bad cholesterol. LDLs are, are known as bad cholesterol. And then HDLs are the good cholesterol. So if you get a blood panel done um, in terms of testing your cholesterol level, uh, like maybe your cholesterol level is um, 160, which is actually very healthy. Um, but you may not uh, have, have um, a celebration for that if your LDL percentage of that is, is really high compared to your HDLs. So that's why in addition to the total number you get for cholesterol levels, they also want to look at um, what's the HDL number and what's the LDL number. So the reason why uh, low density lipoproteins are called bad uh, cholesterol is because this is the kind of lipoprotein that takes um, lipids to your peripheral tissues, like into the bloodstream and to your tissues. So if you're doing uh, too much of that, uh, the cholesterol levels in your bloodstream, um, bad. Um, but HDLs is, is the opposite in the sense that um, high density lipoproteins, they, they take fats out of um, your bloodstream uh, for the sense of storage. And so that's why uh, the bad is bad and the good is good. Um, depending on the person, um, this is not the best term to use uh, because somebody could have a, uh, an HDL level that is actually too high. Um, and just because your LDL is high doesn't mean you're going to have a heart attack soon. Um, so those are just general terms um, that people look at in, in terms of measuring HDL versus LDL. So now on to proteins. This is the most abundant organic compound in the body. Like I said earlier in the lesson, if you took all the water out of a body, protein is the next most abundant substance. Uh, the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. And like uh, sugars and like lipids, the way that you put together amino acids is a dehydration synthesis. Uh, the way that you break them apart is hydrolysis. And it's the same with attaching uh, those three fatty acids to the glycerol. So those uh, dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis terms are applicable here as well. They are water soluble as a whole. What I mean by that is your protein as a whole, this is a computer generated model of uh, protein structure. So this thing as a whole is okay with water. Um, the whole thing would be considered water soluble. But there are some amino acids that would be inside of this potentially that are nonpolar. So there are 20 amino acids in nature. Um, some of them are nonpolar, but the majority okay with water. Many functions. Uh, that's why in one of the first slides of the lesson I said that proteins are arguably the most important because they do so much. Uh, you can't live without uh, carbs and lipids or nucleic acids, but check out all the things that proteins do. Uh, so support, um, in terms of, on a cellular level, the cytoskeleton that's keeping the inside of the cell stabilized, made of protein. Um, in terms of the connective tissue in your body that's supporting organs as a whole, supporting your body as a whole, it's made of proteins, uh, protein fibers. Movement, so movement within a cell, um, movement of your body as a whole happens because of protein. Your muscle proteins allow you to move, extremely important. Uh, transport, so not only shuttling uh, molecules through the bloodstream like attached to a protein, Hemoglobin is a classic example, that's a protein, but also uh, transport in and out of cells, uh, membrane proteins, channel proteins. Buffering, uh, if it wasn't for proteins, um, certain molecules would have a uh, greater ability to harm you in terms of uh, pH levels. So uh, buffering, very important. Enzymatic action, enzymes. There are millions of enzymes. Uh, they all are made of proteins, so they are um, protein molecules that help a reaction along. Hormone synthesis, there are a lot of proteins um, in your body designed just for making hormones. Um, one of them would be uh, epinephrine, adrenaline, uh, made of protein. 
and defense. One example of that would be antibodies. So antibodies, which uh, you know target bacteria, foreign invaders in your body, those are made of protein. Oh, and if you're wondering about this uh, image, um, that's going to come up in a sec in terms of um, the different structural levels of protein. Um, you can have these little uh, helical uh, shaped um, protein parts, uh, and you can have little sheets that are pleated. Um, there's a lot of different shapes you can get from the uh, structural parts of proteins. Amino acids, there are 20 different ones in nature, and that's because there are 20 different R groups. So this is a variable. Um, R, sometimes it'll be an H there. Uh, sometimes it could be something called a benzene ring. Um, sometimes it could be an OH. There's, there's all of these different R groups uh, here that make the 20 amino acids different from each other. The majority of amino acids can be synthesized in the human body. The others are considered essential amino acids. Just like with lipids earlier, essential amino acids you need to take in uh, with your diet. Peptide bonds hold amino acids together. Once again, it's a dehydration synthesis. An OH on this part here called the amino group. Uh, or sorry, I, I misspoke. This is the amino group. I saw the A here and thought differently. This is, uh, they call it acid group here, but I've actually seen this more in textbooks. A carboxyl group is the name for this. So uh, CO2H, you can abbreviate it as that. Um, that's the, the carboxyl group. So an OH on that, and then if you look at the amino group over here, th that makes water. So when these two leave, a dehydration synthesis. So now let me erase this and show you how the peptide bond forms. It's going to be between the nitrogen of one amino acid and the carbon of the carboxyl group of the next and vice versa. So this carboxyl group carbon is going to be linked to a uh, nitrogen of the neighboring amino acid and you can get an amino acid chain um, made of what's called peptide bonds. And amino acid chains are also called polypeptides for that reason. It's just a bunch of peptide bonds stringing together amino acids. So protein structure. There's four basic levels of protein structure. The primary structure is like I just mentioned a second ago, amino acid chains, just a stringing together of amino acids. That's your most basic uh, small little protein. That's what you're seeing here. I know this is in Chinese, but um, this is a really long amino acid chain. That is a primary structure. And they're zooming into these four, uh, showing you what amino acids they are. Cysteine, serine, leucine, phenylalanine. Um, and then, then there's a, whatever other <laughs> amino acids here. So that's your primary structure. Secondary structure, you saw some of them in the, that previous uh, image. When you make bonds between the atoms that are on these amino acids and, and make some kind of shape out of that amino acid chain, um, like that specific shape might be a helix. That shape might be a beta pleated sheet, um, like pleats and pants. Uh, it's the same concept um, in terms of like kind of little folds. That's how you get the secondary structures. So uh, you get a lot of different kinds of, of shaped proteins, um, different protein functions by having different combinations of helices, uh, beta pleated sheets. Um, sometimes these are called alpha helices. Um, the point is that uh, bonds between the different parts of these um, secondary structures is, is how you get from primary to secondary. Then tertiary structures. If I take a bunch of secondary structures and put them together and have them bonded in a way and interacting in a way where it's now a bigger, more functional protein, that's how you get tertiary, the third level. So it's the interactions from the polypeptides and the surrounding fluid uh, near it, as well as R groups. So the specific amino acid chain within the secondary structure, once you put them together, that's going to impact your tertiary structure, especially from a kind of bond called disulfide bonds or disulfide bridges. Uh, so if we had these two attached to one another um, and there was sulfur uh, helping connect them, that's how you would get um, this disulfide bond between the secondary structures to make the tertiary structure. And finally, taking tertiary structures and putting them together, you get a full-fledged protein. Uh, by full-fledged protein, I mean something like hemoglobin, 
uh, which is in red blood cells, or something like catalase, which is an enzyme in the liver. So the quaternary structure is how you get your completed protein with a certain shape matching uh, whatever it's supposed to do, whether it's a catalyzing reaction or a structural protein, whatever. All right, we're done with protein. So vitamins, what are vitamins? Well, um, they're required as uh, vital nutrients in limited amounts. So in, in your uh, daily intake, uh, yeah, carbs, lipids, proteins, um, trace amounts of vitamins are sometimes all that's required. And some people will take a multivitamin uh, daily. Some doctors will joke that you're just paying for uh, expensive urine. Um, and when it comes to the urinary system lessons, you'll see more about that. But the reason why they say that is these uh, vitamins, and I'm just listing a few of them, if you have a well-balanced diet, um, you're taking in enough vegetables and whole grains, etc., uh, you know, different um, uh, protein sources as well, you're going to get these vitamins in, in reasonable amounts in your body. And you may already be excreting some of them out via urine as waste. So people who have a well-balanced diet and are taking a multivitamin every day, they don't necessarily need it. Um, but if it helps you sleep at night, then do it. So when we look at vitamins uh, in terms of their structure, some of them are fat-soluble, meaning not water-soluble, and others are, are polar, uh, meaning they do dissolve easily in water. Vitamin A. Um, vitamin A uh, actually helps form epithelium in your body, which is found in virtually every organ. Uh, and you've also heard about the uh, eye thing, like carrots is one source of adequate amounts of vitamin A. Um, it's not going to give you your sight back, like I need glasses. Uh, I'm, my sight's not going to get better. But in terms of keeping your retinal health uh, up there, uh, the retina is very important. Yes, vitamin A is good for that. Um, vitamin D. Um, not just from diet, you don't, you know, you're not going to get uh, milk as your only source of vitamin D or something like that. You actually, from getting enough sunlight, from enough UV radiation hitting your skin, will, will make vitamin D. Um, vitamin D helps you absorb calcium. So it's, it's for bone growth, uh, for maintenance of bone health, as well as joints. So without vitamin D, you're not going to get enough calcium absorbed into your bloodstream. Um, vitamin E... Um, actually prevents the breakdown of vitamin A and certain fatty acids. Um, vitamin E, not always remembered as much as these two, but important. Uh, vitamin K um, helps with clotting factors. If you do not have enough vitamin K uh, in your body, you're talking some kind of uh, blood disease uh, potentially forming. Um, so vitamin K, need that. Uh, water soluble, B1, B2, B5, B6, B12, that's most of the B vitamins. You get these mainly from uh, meat and milk. Um, some of them from bread, like uh, like B1. But um, yeah, meat, a uh, common source of these. Um, not just meat, but um, you know, let's say you're vegan. Um, if you're vegan, talk to your doctor about some other sources uh, for these vitamins. If if you are completely excluding meat and, and eggs and so on and milk from your diet. Uh, niacin, important. Folate, important. I've, I've actually read that um, folate um, in, in a woman who's pregnant early on, even before she knows she's pregnant, uh, folate's extremely important for the, the development of uh, the embryo in terms of uh, development of the spinal cord especially. So low levels of folate early on in pregnancy makes it more likely a baby could be born with something like spina bifida. Uh, niacin, without niacin, you wouldn't be able to make NAD. Uh, earlier on in this lesson, we talked about what NAD plus is, NADH. Without niacin, you're not going to be able to make that. And, and it's a very important molecule in terms of aerobic respiration. And finally, vitamin C. Here's a picture of vitamin C. Um, vitamin C, you've heard about that. Uh, vitamin C is uh, just an important uh, molecule um, in terms of keeping many different tissues healthy. It's also an antioxidant. Uh, helps lower the risk of cancer over time. Um, not enough vitamin C will give you scurvy. You have heard about um, sailors or pirates uh, hundreds of years ago getting scurvy. Uh, and so they would start keeping oranges on the ship to uh, prevent that vitamin C deficiency from happening. And then we look at minerals. Uh, minerals are really tiny. They're inorganic ions, not organic, uh, released from electrolytes like uh, NaCl, uh, table salt. You're going to get sodium and chloride out of that. Those are minerals. 
functions, osmotic balance, keeping the right amounts of water um, in, in, in different parts of the body, not getting too much on one side or, or too little on the other, or, or losing water or gaining water. Uh, minerals are important for that osmotic balance. Uh, tissue maintenance and use, um, something as simple as like nerve function. Uh, without uh, sodium and potassium, you're not gonna be able to uh, have your neurons functioning properly. Uh, cramps is just the beginning. Uh, enzyme cofactors, um, some enzymes aren't going to work properly without minerals. So examples, I mean, you've heard of these, sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, iron, zinc, copper. Um, if you do take a multivitamin, you're gonna find that, that some of these things are gonna be included. Um, sweat is one way that these come out of the body, not just through urine, but uh, sweating a lot uh, is gonna release some of these minerals or electrolytes. And that's why, you know, people uh, will sometimes drink those sports beverages, um, which you know, also have sugar in them, but um, sports beverages to, to regenerate that. Um, you know, people who get like a muscle cramp, they'll say, eat a banana. And, and the reason why is like, yeah, there's a high amount of potassium in a banana and a muscle cramp may be due to just overuse of the muscle, maybe due to sweating out some of those, um, those particular minerals. And you want to replenish that uh, to get back to uh, normal. So in terms of a balanced diet, uh, I could talk for a long time about this, but I'm just going to highlight some main things. Uh, when you look at a food guide pyramid, you're going to see um, different examples of them depending on what source, but you're going to see grains is making up a lot of what you should be taking in whole grains um, from breads, um, plant products, vegetables. Speaking of plant products, vegetables and fruits. Um, not only contain a lot of important vitamins and minerals and natural source of sugars, but also fiber, very important, which we're going to discuss in the next slide. Uh, Americans in general do not eat enough vegetables and fruits. Um, a lot of people do, but in general, that's something that the average American diet is missing. And studies have shown time and time again that um, a diet high in fruits and vegetables makes it less likely to develop cancer. Um, you know, keeping your tissues healthy, antioxidants, etc. cetera. Uh, dairy, um, you know, milk products. Um, some people refuse to drink milk products or eat cheese, um, yogurt, etc. cetera, but um, dairy does provide um, certain vitamins and minerals that are important. There are other ways to, to get that. Uh, and then meat and beans. Um, you don't need meat. I, I know plenty of uh, vegetarians and vegans who are healthy. Uh, but uh, meat is an easy way to get iron into your body, uh, to get uh, essential amino acids in your body, um, but moderation is key, not too much meat. If, if the amount of meat you're taking in exceeds grains and vegetables, um, constipation is one problem you're going to have, uh, but you're probably going to be malnourished in some way. Uh, beans is a great source of protein as well. Uh, not as much protein as, as jam-packed in meat, but um, beans a good source of protein. This is actually not your typical food guide pyramid. This is a vegan uh, food guide pyramid. And if you look carefully, you'll see that um, there's no animal products involved. Um, so this is a way that someone who is vegan could keep on top of it in terms of making sure they're getting uh, the right amount of nutrients uh, and vitamins and minerals. Oils, you're always going to see... Um, at the top in terms of the, the least amount you should be having per day because it's just a, a source of a lot of fat that you're gonna get anyways from a lot of these um, particular products. So some people will make the mistake of having like a giant salad and, and salad itself, there's nothing wrong with it, um, fruits and vegetables, etc. but a salad with a bunch of ranch dressing poured all over it, uh, that's a bad thing with a good thing. Uh, ranch dressing has a lot of oils, saturated fat. I mean, you're getting animal products um, together to make that ranch dressing. And so that's a source of oils where something like a salad um, actually might be less healthy than some other option uh, using a, a vinaigrette dressing or, um, you know, a vinegar oil combination dressing is going to be a lot lower in the saturated fats and, and higher in unsaturated fats. And finally, nutrition facts. Uh, people see these almost every day and sometimes don't think twice about it. So I'm gonna quickly go through what nutrition facts uh, mean and, and, and kind of why they're important. Um, so serving size. All right, if we look up at the top, uh, whatever package you're looking at, and here we've got macaroni and cheese. Uh, serving size, one cup. Uh, you could mass it to get 228 grams, but just that, you know, that volume measurement, one cup. And there are two servings per container. 
So if you consume the entire box of mac and cheese, you've got to multiply all this by two. Some people forget that. Uh, they look at the nu nutrition facts, they're like, oh, it's only three grams of saturated fat. No, it's actually six because you ate the whole thing. Um, I've seen this even on bags of chips, little bags of chips where people, they're going to eat the whole thing, typically. I've seen little bags of chips where it says two servings per bag. And so it's, it's, it's kind of misleading the person. They got to look carefully uh, and, and they might have to actually double everything uh, in terms of what's in there. So serving size and servings per container, important. So all of these measurements have to do with consuming one serving. Uh, calories. So per serving, this has 250 calories. Calories is, is a way of measuring the amount of energy contained in it. Um, the calories can come from fat, they can come from sugar, uh, etc. So calories from fat, almost half of the calories are from fat, uh, close to half. Um, so that's important to consider too. Um, there was a law passed in California recently that makes it where all the uh, franchise restaurants have to put the amount of calories on the menu. That's great. I think that's great that people can see that, but what they don't have to tell you is the amount of fat calories. So something may be um, 100 calories, like, oh, that's not much, uh, but it might be 70 calories from fat inside of there. Uh, so it's important to, to consider uh, what percentage of calories are actually coming from fat, especially if you're trying to, to lose weight or watch your weight. Um, so when we look at fat, uh, the percent daily value basically means like, hey, if you're on a 2,000 calorie diet, which is eh, kind of average, uh, the amount of calories you're taking in per day, if you want to have the right amount of fat and cholesterol and carbohydrates, you know, by the end of the day, pay attention to the percentages. So if you have uh, 12 grams of fat from this serving, that's only 18% of what you're kind of allowed to have uh, in terms of maintaining a healthy bi uh, balance. So you still can go uh, another 82% in terms of what's left. Um, you don't typically see the percentage for protein. Uh, you know, protein needs really depend on um, your activity and, and, and musculature in a sense. But um, when you look at fat, cholesterol, sodium, carbohydrates, they give you a guide here in terms of um, the percentage. In general, they say, hey, 5% or less, that's low. So if you're looking for a, a low fat kind of option um, and, and you see 20 something, 30% over here, that's not a low fat option because 20% or more is high. For instance, when you look at soup, uh, when the sodium levels in soup, most cans of soup I've seen in the store, uh, you're looking at like 50, 60, sometimes even greater percentage of the amount of sodium in the soup. And, and they're using that sodium to, to flavor it. Um, but you got to watch your salt intake. So fats, when you look at fats in this yellow section, um, saturated and trans. So the total fat, 12 grams, total fat, that includes saturated, trans, unsaturated, and then there's different types of unsaturated fats. There's polyunsaturated, monounsaturated. Uh, they're not listing uh, those here, um, but I have seen on um, different food products where they actually say, hey, here's the amount of monounsaturated or polyunsaturated fats. Uh, so saturated fat, uh, it's only a uh, 25% of the total, uh, 3 out of 12. Trans fats, trans fats, very unhealthy. Um, some restaurants have decided to completely eliminate trans fats. They've been linked to heart disease. Um, you know, a little bit now and then is, is not a big deal. Um, but if you are, you know, watching your, your uh, cholesterol levels, um, heart disease risk, trans fats, not good. Uh, so there's 3 grams in this mac and cheese uh, by the time you add all the stuff in. Um, cholesterol. Uh, so cholesterol is lipidy. Uh, that is a lipid uh, molecule. Cholesterol levels, um, it's only, hey, it's only 10% of what you're allotted per day. Now, if your cholesterol level is high, like let's say your total number with, with a blood panel and, and your LDL is extre extremely high, um, doctors might say, hey, you need to cut cholesterol, cut the fried foods, cut ranch dressing, cut all those desserts, those things that are really tasty because they're going to have cholesterol. Uh, people like myself actually make cholesterol a little bit more in, in, in my liver than other people. Uh, and that's a genetic thing from my mom's side. Um, so I need to, you know, watch my cholesterol levels in terms of not going excessive and, you know, eating desserts after every meal. Uh, but some people like my brother got a little more, more fortunate and he can eat a little bit more unhealthy than me and actually have the same cholesterol level because his liver is not cranking out uh, as much as I am. Sodium. Uh, specifically, you know, from salt, uh, sodium, 470 milligrams 
about 20%. Uh, you're recommended to have around 2,000 milligrams or two grams per day. Uh, some doctors even say that's a lot. Um, it depends on the person. If you have high blood pressure uh, and you have physiological problems in terms of your health, you want to limit your sodium because over time, the more salt you, you take in, uh, the more likely it is that your blood pressure is going to go up. Uh, carbohydrates, sugar. So, hey, when we look at sugars, there's 31 grams. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, there's going to be carbs in that macaroni in terms of the pasta. Uh, there's going to be carbs um, in, in, in the milk and the cheese, etc. cetera. Um, so carbs, 31 grams. That's only about 10% of what you're recommended to have per day. So you can go 310 grams. Um, Atkins diet would be one of those diets where you're not supposed to have carbs. Uh, that's not a healthy option for everybody. Um, so I would talk to your doctor first before going on a no carb diet. Uh, that's an option for some people to uh, lose weight uh, easier. Uh, but for most people, having some carbs in your body every day is, is a good thing. But moderation, of course. Dietary fiber, that's a kind of carbohydrate that we don't uh, actually digest and absorb. Um, it comes from typically cellulose. So cellulose is in plant cell walls. So when you eat something like celery, you know, vegetation, um, it's like Drano for your intestines uh, because you're not absorbing all that stuff. It's, it's kind of sliding through um, and, and, and it's good in terms of keeping you regular uh, with trips to the bathroom. Number two, people who don't have enough fiber in their diet are going to get hard stools uh, and more likely to get constipation. So fiber is good in terms of maintaining intestinal health. Uh, and then sugars, these are those digestible sugars. Um, Notice that there's 31 grams of carbohydrates. Um, sugars here might be just simply glucose, but um, you can see there's 31 total grams of sugars. And then protein, five grams. I mean, protein is very important in your diet, uh, of course, because not only you know for maintaining muscle mass, but you make so many molecules from proteins in your body and, and those amino acids, you don't wanna get low on those. Uh, you can see, of course, that at the bottom, there's, there's vitamins. And depending on what vitamins are in there, um, they'll list those. Um, notice there's no vitamin K listed here, no vitamin E listed here. And that's because this dish is not a significant source of those vitamins. And you can see that they adjust here in terms of like, if your total calorie intake is actually 2,500, well then since your total calorie intake is more then you can take in more grams of all these different organic nutrients. If you go 3,000, of course, you're going to be able to take in more. But it depends on your level of activity and your health. Somebody who's an Olympic athlete, if they're working out six hours a day or more, then maybe a 12,000 calorie diet is appropriate for them in terms of their metabolic needs. But for someone like me, who's, who's not an Olympic athlete, I think 2,500 would be good enough. So thank you for watching educator.com.